For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and this is the readout video from our April 22nd Wednesday Wake Up Weekly email newsletter. If you're not already a subscriber, please go to our website, that's climatediscussionnexus.com, sign up for the newsletter, check out our blog posts, also have a look at our videos, which are also available on YouTube or Climate DN, because there's a lot there to look at and think about. Now, speaking of videos, it looks like we're going to be frozen in place by the quarantine for some time to come, so I'm checking out my rusty home video skills. And speaking of frozen in place, one of the items from this week's Wednesday Wake Up concerns what Norwegian scholars are finding on Lomsegen Ridge near the Lenbreen Glacier as the ice retreats. And by the way, I think that would make a great song title, you know, on Lomsegen Ridge near the Lenbreen Glacier, I gave my heart to a Viking lass. Unfortunately, I'm afraid I'm getting there a little bit late, not so much for the song as for the Viking lass. Because the artifacts that they're finding as the ice retreats indicate that this was a well-traveled route for a good deal of the first millennium AD, from about 300 to 1000. And then after that, it got colder and the glaciers advanced and people stopped traveling that way because glaciers are nice to look at but pretty nasty to live on. And when you hear that glaciers are retreating, you're liable to think, oh no, hottest year ever, ah, we're all doomed. But here's the thing. If there were no glaciers and people were traveling through forest terrain in the first millennium AD, and then the glaciers came, and they're only now retreating, what does this suggest about temperature? Right. That it was warmer in the latter part of the Roman warm period, and indeed in Norway, at least in the early part of the medieval warm period, than it is now, because the glaciers are only now retreating. And in fact, there's some side stories here, including something the BBC reported on back in 2008, where they talked about similar results with alpine glaciers melting. And there were, you know, that's where poor Otzi, the Iceman, was done in around 5,000 years ago, maybe. But the retreating glaciers were also giving up artifacts from the Bronze Age, and from the Roman period. So once again, you see, when people tell you that current conditions are unprecedented, the glaciers are telling a different story. They were not in the Roman period where they were in the 19th and 20th century. That suggests that the Roman warm period was in fact warmer, and that what's happening today is not unprecedented. And speaking of trying to reconstruct temperature, Another item from the Wednesday Wake Up that I think is very interesting. It was in 1988 that James Hansen of Nassau gave explosive testimony before a United States Senate committee that really touched off the modern global warming panic. And when he gave his warning, a lot of climatologists said it's a scary hypothesis, but we don't have very good surface temperature data. In fact, in a lot of places, we really don't have any at all. And that makes it hard to test. And some other people at NASA said, ah, oh, well, we've got satellite readings since the late 1970s. And maybe some of those microwave readings can be used to generate a surface temperature set. The two that succeeded in doing it were Roy Spencer and John Christie. And Spencer recently retold the story, including some of the difficulties you might imagine them experiencing trying to manage data that was stored on gigantic magnetic tape reels. Remember that next time you're frustrated that your browser is slow or that your smartphone isn't quite as smart as somebody else's. But part of Spencer's tale that's very interesting is that their scientific problems were nothing to their political problems because when they managed to start recreating this surface temperature data set, it didn't show the kind of warming that their bosses wanted to see. Their scientific bosses at NASA and their political bosses, people like, you know, Tennessee Senator Al Gore. And so it turns out that the science was politicized to deny what the temperature readings were saying, not in order to disparage global warming, but in order to support the theory. So that's something to bear in mind next time they call us deniers. There's lots else in the newsletter, including the latest edition of our 1919 or 2019 quiz. And partly because with the pandemic, people are casting an anxious eye at the farming sector and wondering, will they be able to get the help they need to harvest some early crops like asparagus? Will they be able to get the spring planting done? So we went down to Welland, Ontario in the Fruit Belt. And 
again, we got the temperature records day by day from right after World War I and just before now. And we put them both on a chart, but we didn't label them. So the challenge is to figure out which of these lines is from cool and comfy 1919 and which is from climate crisis 2019. If you can't tell, and I'm betting you can't, just click on the link on our blog site, you'll get the answer. You'll get the chart with the lines labeled. But if you need it, the challenge to the alarmists here, if you can't tell in place after place, and we've done this quiz for a number of spots in Canada now, if you can't tell the difference between 1919 and 2019, where exactly is this climate emergency? Again, there's lots more in the newsletter. Go to climatediscussionnexus.com and check it out. And again, we'd like to say thank you to all the people from around the world who are sending us messages of support and also going to our donate page and making pledges. I know times are tough. We're all very worried about the future. But if you think this is no time to hammer the economy with bad policy based on worse science, help us push back. Go to the donate page and make a monthly pledge. Small one, $2, $5, $8 a month. Those make a huge difference at our end. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson. Thank you.